think most of our panelists are going to be around after for additional questions. So to kind of wrap things up, I'd love to hear from each of you just a closing thought or a takeaway that you have for the audience from your perspective. Who wants to go first? Diana? We're going to go back to you. Um, two things. One, allow for margin in your life. Most of you, I would expect, are great writers. And when you have a piece of paper, and whether you're typing a note or writing a note, do you squeeze in you know, a, a letter, a word, a phrase on every piece of the white space? No, we allow margin. And yet, each day, we schedule ourselves with almost no white space, no margin. A couple things come to mind. When you have no margin, you can't do your best thinking or your best work. If you want to go into a meeting fully prepared and fully present, it does take at least five to 10 minutes. I know it's not like much time, but it is. If you devoted 10 minutes of quiet time to preparing for what the topic is, even if you're not leading the meeting, what you need, what you'd be prepared for, are there you know, emails or, or you know, memos that you could read or research you could do on trends and issues related to that topic, and you walk into that meeting prepared, people will think, feel, or believe that you are someone who is on the ball. What most of us do is come flying in with a stack of folders hoping that you have the right one for that meeting celebrating you got there on time when that is not your value to that particular session. So margin and also you know, being able to know what you need to do your best think. In addition to music being something I need to do my best thinking, if I have a large strategic initiative I need to focus on, I get a pedicure. It's 35 to 40 minutes, quiet time sitting, and I come up with some of the most fabulous outlines during that time. It's, it's rare that, and so you know, create margin in your day so you can do your best work and appear to be the best uh, to people. The other thing that has been helpful to me is when I heard someone talk about the distinction between being smart, intelligent versus wise. Being smart is, you know, being able to learn something, call it up, spit it out, and there's not much value for being smart anymore because almost all that information is available to people. It's no longer as valued 30, 40 years ago when it was in your head and being smart was powerful. The second level is intelligent, and that is being able to make connections where people haven't made connections before. And you see solutions and strategies, putting things together in a different way. That's being intelligent. That's more valuable. But the most valuable position is being wise. You don't have to be smart or intelligent to be wise, although if you have intelligence and wisdom, you will be invited to the big table, and you will be part of making company decisions. And being wise is oftentimes knowing what to say when and to whom. And sometimes that includes when not to speak, when to ask questions versus make recommendations. And, and it's something to aspire to, is, is, is to be the wise one at the table. Wow. That's like so <laughs> profound to have to follow up on. <laughs> um, but you're so wise, I know you can do it. <laughs> so um, a while back I had a colleague who was very much into branding say, you know, what's your personal brand? What makes you distinct and why is that relevant? And at the time I thought it was a really strange question, but when you get older you realize you do whether or not um, you think about your personal brand, you're conveying one, right? And just like in your business, you're either going to have an intentional brand or someone's going to create one for you. And so um, I think that no matter what age and stage in life are, for me, it continues to be a work in progress. Um, and so I, one day, a few years ago, I was just like, OK, I'm really not happy. And I know that happiness is a choice, right? And so if I'm going to choose to go to work today, how am I going to be happy? And I realized that what I had done as our business began to grow is I started to give away the tasks and activities that I enjoyed the most. And as a result, it sucked all the joy out of everything I did. And I was stuck doing the things I really didn't want to do, like payroll and 
accounting and I thought, my God, why did I outsource writing? I should be outsourcing payroll. And so it was like an epiphany to me. So I guess that um, I just throw that out there and, and, and challenge you because I just thought, oh, if I owned my own business, I'd be so happy, right? And then I realized I wasn't. And so um, just changing some of those things that what I was doing helped me find that joy again. I'd say probably to uh, lesson learned, um, but to not be afraid to use your background, your uh, you know your upbringing, uh, you know your experiences, and and what you do to help the business grow to be a better marketer. Uh, you know, initially when I started my career, sometimes I would sit at the table with um, executives or colleagues, and they'd share their their upbringings, their stories, and they were very different than mine, and I didn't. I felt uncomfortable sharing mine because it was so different. I almost viewed it uh, being different as somewhat of a handicap, which is ironic now because what I do today, you know, involves my background, my upbringing, um, and and I'm able to uh, to make change that way and and to make an impact. And I think sometimes as as young people, you're not sure ab about that. I think it's a huge advantage, a, a huge competitive advantage, um, to to be diverse. And there's many facets of diversity, um, you know, from being female female to male, obviously your, your demographic background, whether you have children or not, all of those things are very important because as a marketer, you're reaching out to, to multiple audiences that you know, may share those perspectives and that upbringing. And it can definitely be a competitive advantage to you personally and I think to your business as well. Let's see, I think it's um, make, a commit, make a commitment to be a lifelong learner. A and I think there's the things that we've heard today that that I'd probably put as kind of the top ones. Um, one is never defend, never justify. And that is so hard. Um, you know, we either want to, instead of saying thank you to the compliment, we want to react, or if somebody is criticizing our work, we want to react. But I think you, if you can really kind of hold those words in, never defend, never justify, and you just listen, you'll, you'll come away with a, a really great takeaway. So I think that's one. I think the second one is um, a phrase someone taught me, and that is emotion eats skills. And that's becoming really good at your emotional intelligence, or you'll hear talk about emotional EQ, to start recognizing, understanding, and then really controlling how you think, feel, and act. And I think I'm still doing that. Um, have the act part, you know, working on that pretty good. The thinking and feeling is much more difficult. But I think that that's probably lesson number two is you know this whole concept of emotion needs skills. I think third is um, don't be afraid to take a job that that a risky job or a job that where you risk failure. Uh, I have done that a lot in my career and I will tell you that has helped me um, where I am today because when you take on something that you don't know, you have to go learn and you have to go outside, you have to go network with other people, you have to go outside your industry and it's, it's at those times that you get that greatest development of growth when you're doing something new. So I'd say don't, don't be afraid of taking something on that, that comes with, with risk. Just trust that, you're, that you've got the talents to, to get yourself out of it. And then I think the last one is, and you mentioned it, um, surround yourself with really good people, especially those that will tell you the things that you don't want to hear. Uh, and it's, it's in those moments um, when you have that trusted confidant or that trusted person at work um, that's telling you what you don't want to hear that you get this greatest greatest growth opportunity. So for me, it's make this personal commitment to be a lifelong learner and take those kind of four, four steps in action. Thank you, ladies. That wraps up our conversations from the She Suite panel today. So let's give everybody a warm applause for contributing. Thank, Thank you. you. I think we've all had fantastic takeaways. Hopefully you enjoyed this as much as I did, just sitting up here <laughs> and soaking in everything they had to say. If you have time, please feel free to stick around for questions. And we're also taking tours around Meredith. So if you haven't been in Meredith's test kitchen or their gardens before, um, if you can take the time to do it, I encourage you to because it's really, really neat and just a cool experience to do. So thank you all for coming today. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you.